You you punched him right in the nuts, didn't you? <laughs> Damn it, Dad! Like, <laughs> what's going on, Dad? Like, why haven't I been able to like order a soda at Chipotle for the past ten years because it's too expensive? But yet you're running these multi-billion dollar funds. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sanzano, host of Jake and Gino Podcast. Here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, father, six, best-selling author, the G Daddy, Gino Barber. Gino, how's it going? Jake, doing good. Not looking as good as you are, brother, but I'm doing all right, my friend. How you doing? It's not easy for most, my friend. It's just <laughs> not easy. Uh, doing great. Always making it happen, big man. Today's guest is the founder of two investment funds that have done over 217 deals in the last four years. That's that's a lot of work. It's, that's uh, That's flipping right there. Currently, he manages an eight-figure hedge fund, Ugly Unicorn, and has started helping others launch their own funds through his online program, Fund Launch. So without further ado, Bridger Pennington, welcome to the show. Fellas, good to be on here. It's going to be fun today. No relation to Chad. No, I wish. You know, <laughs> Chad, Ty, all these famous Penningtons, and I don't yeah. know any of them. So yeah, I'm just my own, I'm on my own little island. So it's a, it's a, a ways yeah. down the 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 family tree, but maybe I maybe. guess yeah. I mean it's a far if you if you see me on the I think I'm okay at sports. I, I played in a basketball game last night though, and man, I got I got smoked. So I'm a, I'm a far step away from from Chad <laughs> on the athletic field. But fair anyways, enough. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. So sports aside, uh, let's let's get into business. Uh, you know, share with us uh, how you got started and uh, and you know what you're doing today. Yeah, so the, I'll give you the, the 30 seconds, and we can dive in deeper if you want. But I uh, I started um, six different businesses my first two years of college, and then I'll, I can tell you that story if you'd like. But now run a uh, you know started a fund out of college when I was 22 years old, and then started another fund um, doing uh, we we're doing loans, a debt fund. So we're doing these small short term loans. Did a lot of deals out of that. Sold that fund, had an exit, and then actually started another fund called Ugly Unicorn. It's a it's a blockchain crypto fund. We manage eight figures, and that's a hedge fund. Um, and that's a, it's a really fun fund right now. We have the Bitcoin having coming up. We have all these different things happening in crypto. And additionally, I run a GP stakes fund. So during that time period, my dad, he runs a multi-billion dollar fund. My brother is a investment uh, securities attorney, investment funds attorney for a multi hundred million dollar fund. And so between the three of us, we started to make content online. So we started to make content on how funds are built, how to start a fund, how to scale one, et cetera. And none of us went to Harvard. None of us went to Ivy League schools. All of us are pretty much just idiots, but we figured out how to do funds and have made a lot of money doing it. And so that kind of dovetailed into our company called Fund Launch, um, where we now have 60,000 students around the world. We've helped, uh, let's see, last I checked, 12 funds. We have 12 student funds over $100 million, 54 funds over $10 million. Um, and these are funds in multifamily, real estate, debt, private equity, hedge funds, venture capital funds. I mean, across the board, across the world, it's, it's actually really cool to hear <laughs> and help some of these guys' funds. I mean, I'll tell you one, one example. One of these funds we help, like these are such niche, niche funds. One guy, he comes to us, and he's like, hey, I have this hydrogen facility. We take cow manure and we turn it into hydrogen. We have a $60 million facility in Wyoming. We want to build two more. And we're like, cool, let's do it. So we set up a fund. We help him raise capital. And boom, he's running like the largest, at least last I checked, hydrogen facility in the United States. They take literally cow manure and turn it into hydrogen. Another guy came to us. He found this little niche arbitrage play. He, uh, he's on Hollywood. Uh, he'll go buy scripts from writers that are broke. So he'll find like a mini series, like a little TV show. He'll buy it for 30 or 50 grand from a writer. He'll then, he has good connections. He turns around and sells it to HBO, Netflix, Amazon Prime for $200,000, $300,000 for this script. And that's all he does. He built a fund around that and he returns capital to investors. Um, we have people Dude, that do that's, all, that's like, not far off from a ghostwriting fee. So that's beautiful, right? Like maybe <laughs> yeah, he should be giving him like true. 50 or 60, but shit, that's not bad, right? Yeah. So anyways, we've, we've been able to help people all around the world do this kind of stuff. And, and, um, it's been, it's been pretty cool. So, so I can go deeper than that. That's kind of, that's kind of the cliff notes, some hooks for people if they want to want to stay on the show, but it's been pretty fun. It's been really cool to help people. We now throw big events. We have multi-thousand person events. We throw to just help more people understand the game of investment funds. Bridger, why did you go to college? I mean, you're in college two years in, you're already doing funds. What was the purpose of going to college? Was it to please dad? Was it to get a piece of paper? Or what, what was the idea of going to college? Yeah. So I went uh, out of high school. I went on a two-year church mission. Actually, I went to Taiwan. I, uh, I speak Mandarin Chinese now very fluently. Um, came home, wanted to go to school um, for just a number. Let's of years hear it. We got it. We got to hear the Mandarin. Like say, say hello, Gino. You look wonderful today. Ah, Gino, you you very beautiful. This is Wow. 
Is he? Is that? Is that real, Gino, or is he making shit up? He just said, Gino, you, you look like a moron, Gino. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, a what, what a stupid had a little accent to it too. That was beautiful, man. Yeah. So, anyways, I went to school. My my whole premise about school, by the way, um, is I think you go to school to make money. That was at least the way I thought about school and life. Um, and I don't know who taught me that, but someone taught me that. And I was like, okay, I go to school to make money. The reason I'm here, the reason I'm taking classes, because the alternative is if I had enough money or someone paid you. Uh, like every route you take in school eventually leads to money. I don't care if you go after your passion project or you're like, you have this passionate thing you go after. Eventually you're doing it because of money. Like you look at all these NBA players, whoever, they always go back like, well, it's a job. And everything, even if you love it becomes a job. And so you might as well pick a job that's very high paying. That was my opinion on life. Um, and the, the contrary, I, I tell friends all the time, go, no, Bridger, I do my passion. I'm going after my passion. I go, okay, great. You're working your passion right now. What if they stop paying you? Mm-hmm. what would you do in a month from now, two months, six months, a year, you'd probably have to get a job to earn money. So by definition, you are, even if you're doing your passion business, and I think you should do something you care about and enjoy, but you're ultimately doing it because of dollar bills. And for me, like I was passionate about skiing and I like doing just like, I don't know, I like riding motorcycles and stuff. So like, um, I, I can't get paid to do that. So I might as well earn a very high income doing a job that makes a lot of money so I, that I can go do those things. So that was my opinion going to college. And I can we stop right there, was, guys, real quick? Because there's yeah. there's a lot to unpack there, and and I want to dive into these are like two hot buttons for me. So the first one is go to school for money, duh. And I'm not saying duh to you to be rude. That's what it was meant for. You go and get a skill that you can bring to the market and, and be a, a more useful human being. And it's been distorted into this. I don't even know what the hell you want to call it indoctrination camp for politics. And I think that's where a large percentage of school is now where kids go in, they get indoctrinated and they become weak. And so there's a huge Mm. issue there because I do believe that is the purpose of higher education to make you a more useful citizen so you can go and help produce in in a thriving society. And, And so I'm pissed about that. And I just think we should acknowledge that. And the second one is the passion piece. And Myself, I always talk about this with Gino, but I, I was into fitness. I still am. I went to you know school, became a personal trainer afterwards and thought I was living my passion. And you know the Steve Jobs quote, you know, follow your passion, you never work a day in your life. I think that is the worst thing that Steve Jobs has ever said. I think he was passionate about Apple. So it got, it got twisted into that. But ultimately, every time I've done something that I've liked, football, fitness or whatever, I, I start to hate that. I start to hate the thing that I was passionate about. So the, the idea for me, and I think I'm hearing what you're saying, is that get good at something that you're going to be able to make money doing so you can still enjoy your passions and create a lifestyle where you can allocate time towards those passions. And, and you'll enjoy the business aspect when you're good at it and you're making money. That's, that's, been, oh. my, that's been my oh. journey. There, there's- a lot of people love what they're good at. Ah, I love that. Sorry, go ahead, Gino. No, there's two things that trigger Jake: Bitcoin and passion. Getting into passion because he 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 pours that, and I and I do to a certain degree. I had a restaurant for 20 years. I love to cook. I'm Italian. It's in my blood and my veins. I couldn't make a lot of money doing it, and I understand that. And Jake, to your point, there's one other thing you need to go for higher education. It's called critical thinking. You want to go to college to be able to critically think and formulate opinions and try to debate and discuss opinions. And that's been taken away this last 15 or 20 years. So why go to college? I sent my kids to college because my son, he's a senior. He can read a T12. He can read a statement of cash flows. That, that's why he's going to college, to your point, Jake. So when he gets out, he has I a I had to buy a book translate. about critical thinking after I, I have a master's degree. It's a total waste of time. I actually had to buy a book called Critical Thinking. And I, and I read that after college because it didn't do it for me. You know, educate yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So on at my my take to college, and I'll tell any I've I talked to a lot of college kids now because they call me because I'm I'm just a few years removed from college right now. But my first year, two years, I you know most kids go to college they take generals they make you take your general classes. I didn't take any of those, dude. I was like, why would I take generals? I'm gonna take stuff that I'm interested in that can make me money and like almost test or date different genres. So I took an accounting class, finance class, econ class. I took a real estate class. I took an SEO class. I took a negotiations class my first year of college. And it was like so fun. Oh my gosh. I learned an incredible amount of stuff. And then the second year I was like, okay, I'm going to go a little bit deeper on it. Cause that was stuff that I started to get interested in. I started to buy courses while I was in college that were outside of school and pull it together. So, so I'm going too long in the story, but I started, no, I good. actually started six businesses my first two years of college not just business ideas, like actual businesses that were up and running. I started a Chinese tutoring business. I had six different um, 
uh, excuse me, seven tutors that worked for me. I did a actually wholesale two houses. Do you guys I know you guys do real estate? I wholesale two houses in college. I started to build websites for people. I was making three, four grand a month building websites for people. Um, I had a couple employees we started to build out. Anyways, and finally my dad comes and grabs me and he's like, Bridger, you're kind of like a chicken with your head cut off. I want you to go meet with my business partner. This guy can really help you out. Now, to give you some background, I grew up in a very normal house. Nothing bad, but nothing great either. My dad drove a car with a dent in the door, old Ford Expedition, had like 200,000 miles on it. Nothing fancy. And I just knew my dad was an entrepreneur. He just started businesses and had kind of ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. I drive to his business partner's. So I set this meeting up. I go to his business partner's house and I pull up to this house. It's a gated community. Beautiful, huge, white, gorgeous mansion. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, who's my dad's business partner? This guy is loaded. And I park my car. I go up to the door, knock on the door. This guy brings me in his house and it's immaculate. I mean, he's huge. He's got the ceilings, he's got a basketball court in his basement. He's got a full a pool in the backyard, cars in the garage, like this huge home. And I was like, wow. And I sat down to make a long story short. I finally asked him, how did you get all of this? Like, how'd you do this? And he said, Bridger, in my twenties, I was a lot like you. He goes, I started a number of businesses. He goes, actually, I had moderate success. But then he goes, then I met a guy who changed everything for me. This guy was a young dude. He ran a private equity fund and he was one of the wealthiest people I'd ever met in my entire life. He goes, then I learned the secret of the wealthy and the ultra wealthy, the ultra wealthy families of the world. They want their kids to go to the best universities and get experience stuff. And then they want them to get in the fund space, whether that's a real estate fund, private equity, hedge fund, venture capital fund, or to come back home and run the family office. Because this is what a majority of wealthy families want their kids to get into. And so he, he said, I set a goal. He goes, I, don't, I didn't care if it was one year, five years, or 20 years. I was going to figure out what a fund was, how to start one, and how to scale one. And he goes, that's what we did. And he goes, right now we manage just over $8 billion of multifamily real estate. And I was like, holy crap. Now to put that in perspective, like Cardone Capital, Grant Cardone, that's two times bigger than Cardone Capital is today. Now, uh, that was like seven, eight years ago. Uh, today, their funds are over, they're 10 times bigger than Cardone Capital. Just put it in perspective of how big these funds are for people that are listening. And so I was blown away. I was like, dude, can you be my mentor? Can I, sh I'll show up early. I'll get you coffee. Like whatever you need to do this, let me like follow you around. And he said, Bridger, go talk to your dad. Your dad knows way more about us than I do. And I said, no, my dad's broke. He's poor. Like, I want to learn from you. Like you're rich. <laughs> like, can I learn from you, bro? And he's like, Bridger, sorry to break it to you but me and your dad make about the same amount of money. And my chin dropped to the floor. I was like, huh, come again. And he's like, yeah, me and your dad are pretty much equal business partners in this thing. And anyways, I left the dude's house. I drove straight to my dad's house. You, you punched like, him dad, right in the, the nuts, heck? didn't you? Damn it, dad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what's going on, dad? Like, why haven't I been able to like order a soda at Chipotle for the past 10 years? Cause it's too expensive, but yet you're running these multi-billion dollar funds. And anyways, my dad kind of laughed and he said, Bridger, yeah, we're, we're doing pretty well. He goes, I, I like to live a very conservative, safe. I play things down a lot. My business partner likes to spend a lot of money. And anyways, we just live different lives. But he goes, yeah, we, we run these funds. And to make a long story short, the next six months, my dad, I went over to his house every Sunday night and he would teach me about funds. We get the whiteboard out. He'd teach me how funds are built, how the SEC works, how an LPA PPM agreement works, how a general partner, a limited partnership management companies, how they all work together. Um, international feeder funds, Cayman Island funds, like this whole mantra of funds. And funny thing about life is when you start to learn about something, you start to recognize that thing in your life. And I was in college. I was actually working a job in college too. And at that job, I saw an opportunity where I could launch a fund for the clients that were coming through that, that business. And so I talked to the owners of the business. They liked the idea. And I had this idea where we do financing for these clients that were coming through this business. So we, I, at 22 years old, I started to set up this little fund and I built this fund out and I was building the structure and putting the, the legal pieces together. My dad was a great mentor, put that all together for me. And then I hit this wall of like, crap, a great idea for a fund, but who's going to give me money? Like, how am I going to raise money there? You know, I I'm inexperienced. I've never ran a fund before I'm in college. Like who's going to give me an investment. And then I thought, aha, my dad will invest like, duh. You know, my dad's rich. Apparently he doesn't spend his money on cars and houses. He'll probably, he'd love to invest. And so it was a late Sunday night. I went and met with my dad and I gave him the whole pitch. Like I laid everything out for him. And I said, dad, how would you like to be our first investor into our fund? And my dad kind of smiled and he said, uh, Bridger, I have the money to invest, but if I invest in your fund, it would ruin the experience of you raising money on your own. This will be a crutch that you'll never be able to recover from. Ah. And he said, no. 
And he kicked me out. I kind of walked out with my tail between my legs a little bit. And he said, uh, you got to go figure this out on your own. And so I walked out. I, I said, you know what? Screw my dad. I'm going to take him up on the challenge. And I went out. I talked to everybody I knew. I talked to former bosses, college professors, neighbors, like anybody. And I raised, it took me like four weeks. I raised about uh, $49,500 from seven investors. So that's like an average check of like, what? five to 10 grand, like small check. It was, teeny. Yes. it was like yes. teeny, but it was enough to get started. That was actually enough money. We were doing these small micro loans. I started my first little fund and we got a, our group, a 64% return on their money. So small amount of money, but good return. I ran that for about six or seven months. We then collapsed it. We then started it. We kind of restructured it, made it a lot bigger and better. And then I ran that for the next three and a half years. We raised and deployed millions of dollars out of that next fund. Um, that's where I did. I did hundreds of deals um, out of that fund. It did very well. We finally had gained so much market share in our little space, little industry. A competitor came and bought me out when I was, I don't know what's called. I think I was 25 years old, 24, 25 years old. Um, in college, I was making over $100,000 a year. Like, And I was still going to school with other kids, running this fund in school and trying to do internships and get it, you know. And um and then from since then, I kind of already mentioned, we started to now start a program and teach people online how to do funds. And I, since after we sold that fund, I launched a hedge fund that's in the crypto space. We raised $10 million our initial launch. We now um, run this eight figure hedge fund. And then just recently we've launched a GP stakes fund. Now that we invest into other funds and take GP stakes. And I'm a partner on, uh, I guess, strategic advisor on eight other funds as well. And it's been, it's been phenomenal. So that's kind of the story so far. It's still unfolding, but yeah, that's kind of the story. Bridger, let me ask you a question. Seriously. What were you thinking going to your father? Who's not going to buy you a Coke at Chipotle. He's going to invest in your fund. What made you think he was going to say yes to 50 G's when he's not giving you the $3 Coke during the week? Huh? What was that thought process? Like, I mean, did you really think he was going to invest in your fund? You were just like, ah, hey, let me just try it. Well, I, yeah, you got to shoot your shot. Shooters got to shoot. So I thought, hey, I'm just going to shoot my shot. And well, and he was, by the way, he's, by, and I'll say this about my dad. My dad is an incredible mentor still to this day. My dad is not involved in any of my businesses. He's not a partner, nothing. He is totally retired. He like doesn't, doesn't do any of that. But anytime I call him up on the phone, he'll answer and give me great business advice. And so mm -hmm. he had helped me a lot through the fund, thinking about setting up that fund. And I, I was like, Hey, I, my dad, obviously it sounded like he liked the idea. He liked the business. He was giving me good advice. Like it was going to work. And so by default, I thought, well, my, he might also want to invest as well. That was kind of my thinking. And, uh, and it turned out to be a no, but, uh, I thought, Hey, shooters got to shoot. Right. <laughs> Before we get into to raise, hold on, hold on. Was it harder to raise the five grand than later on getting 50 and a hundred thousand dollar checks? Oh yeah. It was, I mean, it's the same. Who the hell's going to give you five grand? Like that's such a hard, I feel like that's almost impossible because you're, you're going to folks that grandma a lot. Dude, that's tough, right? <laughs> grandma well, I was trying to raise more. I was trying to raise more money, but like, I was like, Hey, let's do 25 grand check, 50 grand check. And then people would like beat me down. Hey, can I just give you eight or 10? <laughs> those, like, those, sure. those were like, <laughs> those were like I'll like, take whatever I can get yeah. at this. Cause I was just, and I actually, the nice thing though, was the deal, like we were doing these small loans that were three, four or $5,000 a loan. They would last like two to three months. So we didn't need that much money to prove our concept. And so I was, I was just going to take whatever money I could get. And, um, yeah, that's, that's pity checks, it. Gino, pity checks. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Bridger. Honestly, but I like that story. Let me cut you off, Gina. Sorry. I like that story just because I think people think, Oh, if I'm going to ever raise money or start a fund or do a syndication, I've got to go raise $25 million, which is, that's totally fine for some people. But I, I also think there's a, a place for just getting started. No, you're not, I'm not going to make a, I'm not going to retire off of raising 50 grand and investing it. But what I'm going to do is build a track record and build a reputation. And I told the investors, I, that's what I tell them. I said, Hey, I'm charging 0% management fees. I only make money when you make money. And I'm doing this because yeah, we're going to make some money here and I'm going to make you a great return. But I want you to brag to your friends about how good of an investment you had with Bridger. Cause I plan to do this for the next 50 years. And it's all about goodwill. And so I want to produce really good returns, whether it's a small amount or a big amount. I want to produce really good returns for my investors and have a reputation of someone who's a good money manager. Mm -hmm. and, and investors, I think, resonated with that story. And I said, hey, let's do this. And I, again, our first group investors got a 64% return, cash on cash return. Year two in our second fund, I believe we did 62. Next year was 47% cash on cash return. And next year was 36% cash on cash return. And then we sold the fund. Mm -hmm. Um but it was like, oh, wow. Okay, Bridger now has a reputation over four years of getting a good return to investors. And then we go launch another fund in crypto. And it's like, oh, okay. If he did it here, maybe he can do it here. And we've started that fund. And we now publish our results. And we've done decently well in that fund. And so anyways, 
that I think that's a good lesson. At least I wish I, and I'm happy I just started. So too many people, in my opinion, wait so long until they can have this critical mass of scale and they never start building a reputation as a good money manager, even if it's a small dollar amount. In the multifamily space, it's the same thing. We tell our students, think big, start small. If you want to start at 100 units, it may be more challenging, but start with the 10 unit, start with the 15 unit, prove your credibility. All of a sudden, Jake and Gino did their first deal. Wow. People start talking. Can I get in on that? If you wait and wait and wait, it's not going to not gonna work out. But I really want to, let's chunk down into the idea of funds. I really want to get your take on who should start a fund and who should not start a fund. I think that's really important to dive into it because it's not for everybody, but it seems like it can fit any business model, any niche, any investment out there. Yeah. Starting a fund is not for everybody. Um, what I tell people, if you have, if you're a good bu business owner, and or good investor or portfolio manager. And you've already, so I tell people, if you haven't, if you haven't done that yet, go build that first. Do a few syndications, start. Uh, we had a one guy, he, he would flip four houses a year. He was pretty good at flipping houses. We then built a fund. He flipped 72 houses the next year, right? So he had a good investment strategy. He just needed money to scale. All the fund do, does is just bolt on to your existing business and or uh, investment strategy and just allows you to scale. It's a method to scale. So if you have, if we have business owners that have, you know, they have a successful restaurant, we then bolt on a fund. They go buy up 13 other restaurants that are competitors nearby and or franchises scale and blow up, right? It, all a fund does is just bolt on. Um, so that's what I tell, that's what I tell people um, about funds. Now, if you, you should not run a fund, your other part of your question, you should not run a fund if you have a propensity to lie. If you're not someone who can manage your own money, if you're not someone who can manage, a, you know, a small amount of investor money, if, if you're someone if you have $8 million sitting your, just sitting in a bank account and it just makes you sit up at night and you can't think too much, you shouldn't get in the money management game. Um, you will eventually commit fraud. You will eventually, you know, and most people, in my, in my opinion, we can talk about this as well. I don't think set out to commit fraud from day one. I think most people, what happens is they're a few years in and mom gets cancer. And it's a million dollars to pay for cancer overseas, whatever treatment in Turkey or something like that. And they go, well, it's mom's life. And I've got $10 million sitting in this account over here for my fund. You know, I'm going to take a loan from the fund. I'll pay it back though. And then they borrow a little bit to pay for, they have good, good reason. Mom's got cancer. I got to pay for mom's cancer. And they borrow from the fund and they just committed securities fraud. But it, is, it was good and it was well intended. And then they go pay for can the cancer treatment and they come back and then they can't pay back the loan. And what happens is they end up going to jail and it slowly it takes them Don't on a path. Don't you think it's they more like I'm, I'm going to borrow for the lie. house in the Caymans? Mm. Like the, the mom with the cancer thing, like mom's got insurance, right? Come on. You can cover mom's insurance. I feel like it's more like, you know, they get greedy. Well, yeah. And I, again, we can go through every fraudster in history, but it's uh <laughs> In my opinion, I, I actually like studying fraud. I think it's very yeah. interesting. I love like American Greed, those shows. But in, a lot of times when I look at them, it, I don't feel like they started on a path of destruction. From They didn't have this master grand plan. It started with a small loan or borrow because they, they justified it in some way, shape, or yeah. form. Yeah. That's why I like to use the mom cancer. Like They justify it in their own brain. Like, you know what? That makes sense. Like it, the, the I'm only going to do it one time. Means, yeah. Yeah. And then what happens is they go, well, crap, I'm now down or I got to go gamble harder. I've got to like earn it back. And so then they take bigger risks and it just drains. And then they violated their, you know, securities agreements. And, and now they're going to jail. And they're, Man, how did I end up in this spot seven years later? And I think it's a, it's just a little trickle path down that. And so what I tell you, if you're someone who has a propensity to lie, not manage money well, like you should not get in this game at all. You should actually run away from this game. But if you feel like you have integrity, if you have a good business model that you can scale and you feel confident putting your money in and like, it's so such a good idea that you want to, you want to get everyone else in because it's such a good, you know, niche or strategy or arbitrage play that you figured out, then I think you should think about approaching a fund. I think it's also guys like the performance, right? They got to keep showing the performance to get more money. So that's where the Ponzi stuff comes in because they have to beef up the the quote unquote returns. Look how good I am, right? You got to forever be hitting, you know, 350 and 50 home runs a year. And that's the other piece to it. I think that's probably even bigger than sometimes, you know, pulling the money out for, uh, you know, the, the greed or the, the, the immediate life need. I think it's that, uh, you know, they feel the need to have that constantly high performance. And that's where they get, a lot of guys get yep. bit in the ass.
No, that's a great point, Jake. That's a great point. You you said you know some really great things about the reasons why you should start a fund. Some of the real positives to be able to scale a company. What are some of the downfalls and some of the negatives of starting a fund? Yeah, so with a fund and or let's just call it syndication as well, a fund is going to be more expensive to run, um, like to set up. Uh, a fund is going to be more um, more compliance work. It's going to be a you know you have more properties, more deals. It's just bigger. It's it's playing a bigger game. And some people don't want to do that. Um, I'll kind of compare for people like, you know, setting up a syndication, whether that's, in my opinion, that's raising like a deal by deal basis. A lot of people probably listening to the show raise money for a certain deal. And they go to the next deal and the next deal. And versus other people that run a fund, they raise a fund and then that fund can go buy 13 or 15 or 20 deals in a fund as a pool, a blind pool. Um, most people that I talk to and work with, uh, if they're good syndicators, they eventually end up in funds for a few reasons. Number one, um, so this kind of weighs the pros and cons for you, uh, Gino. So with a syndication, deal by deal basis, it's typically easier to raise money on a deal by deal basis. It's actually less cost legal to raise that, to like set up the legal docs as well. The, the cons though are you have investors have exposure to one deal. In a fund, they're diversified across 20 or 30 deals. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, in a fund versus syndications, funds can typically get cheaper cost of capital. They, they're a repeat client with banks. They can get a lot cheaper cost of debt versus syndications is a one-off basis. They're going to pay just the market rate on debt. Um, another one is liability. In a syndication, depending how you structure it, a lot of syndications though, um, let's say your biggest investor in a syndication, you know, the guy that's put in 40% of the money, he calls you up, Gino. Hey, Gino, um, you know, I remember that 100 unit deal we did in Dallas. Yeah, you know what? I Guess what? I forgot to pay taxes last year. And I've got this huge tax bill. Uh, can you sell the property early? Can you get out of this thing? I need to pay money right now. And they're your biggest person in syndication. A lot of times they can put their elbows out and they can kind of nudge and move the portfolio and move the asset class. And maybe, and you're like, man, I don't want to sell this thing yet, but my biggest investor is going to pull out and, and they can, they can force your hand in a lot of ways. Um, and actually force other investors to sell when you don't want to sell and, and even sue the partnership and, and cause a lot of problems in a fund. The reason I believe most people move to a fund is that exact reason is less liability in a fund. There's a great scene. If you guys have seen the, the big short, have you seen that movie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where the Michael, Michael Burry's in his office, this big investor comes in. He's like, Michael, like, give me my money back, sell the position, get out. And Michael's like, no, the housing market's going to crash. Just give it a few more months. Like it's going to be here. And the guy's yelling and screaming at him. And Michael just says, sorry, that right there is the beauty of a fund is even if your biggest investor has a tax problem or needs to pull money out, you say, sorry, my fiduciary responsibility is not to individual investors. It's to the fund. It's to do, my responsibility is to do what's best for the fund. And what's best for the fund right now is to not sell our 100 unit apartment complex in Dallas. And I'm sorry, there's a, if there's in our LPM PPM, you can pull your money out. It's a 50% penalty to pull your money out. So you can pull your money out. You can sell it to another investor but I'm sorry. And what it does is it protects other investors. Other investors want that because you don't want somebody to come and jerk around your fund or investments and, and be forced to sell. Mm. Um, and it's, it, uh, so I, anyways, so you got to close that story out though with the email that he sent after everything crashed to the investors. Do you remember that? I don't, what did he say in the email though? I remember him typing it out, but what did he say? No, it was, it was, it was basically to the fact that, uh, here's your, you know, 10,000% return. Thanks very much. And then it, it concluded to say that the two never spoke again. So the dude comes mm. in bitching at him. Then he makes him, you know, boatloads of cash, but the guy's got too big of an ego and they just never speak again. It's pathetic. But, <laughs> so. Pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. pretty crazy. Bef before we go to the short answers, give us a couple tips on raising capital. I mean, what have you done right early on, even to get that 7,000 bucks and how's it translated into your raises now? Um, yeah, with with capital raising, it's a there's different approaches. With case you're raising either institutional money, family office money, or high net worth money, and your check size will drastically change how you raise capital. Uh, in my opinion, um, there are people that I've seen that are really good at raising money from institutions, but you put them in a room with high net worth individuals and they just can't talk the language. Right? There's other people that are really good at raising money from high net worth individuals. They're just, they're buddy, buddy. They're, they take, they're just really good at that space. And you put them in a, a room with institutions and they get eaten alive. 
So I think there's different skill sets for different types of capital you are raising. Now, what I'm going to speak to is more people that are raising from high net worths and or family offices in that realm. Um, I kind of break people up into three different tiers of raising capital. And this is something I, I um, it's almost just like a funnel of raising capital, but it helps make it sense. Cause I have a lot of people that come to me, Bridger, I'm, I'm struggling to raising capital. I can't raise any money. And I go, okay, well, what's going on? Are you having problems like number one, getting in what I call getting in the room? Are you around people that have money? Yes or no. Then from there, okay, maybe you're around people that have, like you're at the party, you're at the networking event. There's people with money there, but how good are you at converting or warming those people up to someone that then moves to step three, which is someone that you actually can pitch and close. Does that make sense? Yes. So do you show up that you're in the room? Are you just a wallflower or are you actually someone that can warm people up in your networking space to someone that then by step three, you actually are on a call, you have a pitch deck, like a boardroom, like you're actually closing them. And then let's break that down on where you're falling short. Maybe you get a lot of people warmed up. You have a lot of pitch calls, but you just suck at closing. Okay, let's work on that versus maybe just top of funnel. You're just not getting around the, or the right people, uh, enough people to get in the room. So to kind of, if, if that's making a little sense, those three stages, I'll break down each one briefly. So like step one, getting in the room. Uh, I believe there's two ways to get into rooms. You can work your way in or buy your way in. Working your way in is, you know, you're working the, the crowd, you're working people, you're working LinkedIn, you're trying to get in, in spaces. The other one is you can just buy your way in. You can pay a $30,000 fee to be at a country club or a membership, or you can buy a Ferrari and be in the Ferrari club of New Jersey. And all of a sudden you just bought your way in and you're in with other people that also own Ferraris in New Jersey. And pretty much every city in the world has a Ferrari club, a Lamborghini club, a Porsche club. Like those are ways you can buy your way in season tickets to a game. That's how you buy your way into these places. Now, once you're in, how do you then convert people and warm people up? Um, uh, and I can, sorry, I'm going too long here, but then, and then also how you close, you can get on pitch calls and close from there. We can dive in deeper at that, but you know, talking about capital raising, I'd like to think about it that way. And where's, how's my funnel working? How can I tweak and tailor those things to get more people, I guess, through and, and through this offering? Jake, before we go to the, sh the short answers, last question, let's talk about the close, because I think people are afraid to ask for money and they're, they're not offering the opportunity. They're asking for money. What are some things that you would say to the person listening to this? This is what you should do or implement on your close. Oh man, I could talk about this for like an hour. I love this strategy and how, how this works on a pitch deck and, and or what you're selling. Now, every offering is going to be different. There's not one right way to do this. Uh, what has worked for me though, um, and actually has worked really, really well. Um, I like to approach any type of selling with uh, the, this mindset. And I'll, I'll steal some of this from Oren Claff. He's one of the best cap raisers in the world. He actually came on our, our uh, group just a few weeks ago to teach about cap raising. This guy's raised hundreds of millions of dollars for different deals. He talks about this. Uh, you have a croc brain, a, uh, a midbrain, a neurocortex. Another way I break that down is you, have, you need to sell to the vehicle, the internal and external factors of someone. So for example, if I'm selling someone on funds, if I'm talking to somebody like this on the call, you should do a fund. Okay, first off, I got to sell them on the vehicle. Like funds are good. Like funds have made money for other people. And once I can convince you, Gino, like, okay, funds work in general. Yes, you're like, okay, Bridger, I get that funds have worked for other people. Yes, funds, you look at the Forbes 100 list, it is riddled with fund managers. Funds have worked. Okay, yes. But the next question is, okay, Bridger, I get that funds work, but do funds work for me? Ah, uh, it's a different question. Yeah, like Gino's like, yeah, Bridger, I get funds work for other people, but can it work for my situation? And let me share some stories or things that break down internal false beliefs. So vehicle and then internal. And then finally, okay, if Gino, if you're to the point like, okay, Bridger, funds work. And you know what? Funds work for me. Then external things. Okay, how much time, how much money, how much effort, how much knowledge do I need to start a fund? And, um, and then from there, it's like, okay, let's start a fund. And I, you know, okay, we'll help you start your fund. What's interesting is, you know, I talked to, and for anybody, if you have a lay down sale, if someone's like, you know, have you ever met somebody like money didn't matter, time didn't matter. It was just like so easy to close them. Mm -hmm. Typically that person, the reason they're a lay down sale is because they've already been closed on the vehicle and the internal false beliefs. And then they're just asking kind of external stuff. And those things are just no brainers because they're already sold that yes, funds work and funds work for me. So money doesn't matter. I don't care how much money it is. I need to, I need to do one, right? Uh, how much time? Cool. I'm in, right? But if people are really stuck on money, typically they're not sold yet on internal or, or vehicle. So, sorry, that was a that was kind of more of a framework. No, it's true though. So, for example, I pitch a crypto fund right now. Okay, <laughs> uh, right now people hate crypto. Two years ago, people loved crypto. Right now, people hate crypto. It's crypto winter, and so the majority of the beginning of my call, I'm selling them on the vehicle of just crypto. 
not even our fun, not even our approach, just crypto in general. And I'll actually ask him right at the beginning, hey, what's your take on crypto? What do you like? Do you not like it? Like it? And let's talk. And we talk, we spend a good chunk of our time right now helping them understand and actually liking the vehicle of crypto. For you guys, it would be multifamily. Some people already like multifamily. It's very easy to sell them on the vehicle. The next piece once, okay, we've sold you on multifamily or the, the asset class. Okay, internally. Now, how does this work for us? What's our unique strategy, unique approach? What's our edge of this deal or process? If I can, if I can sell someone on, okay, multifamily is good. And then internally, we've got a very good edge and strategy for this. The external stuff, it's like a lay down sale. Okay, what's the management fees? What's the pref catch up? Yeah, there might be some questions there. What's the tax, tax stuff? But it's, it's like, oh man, I'm in for a quarter million dollars. I'm in for half a million. I'm in for a million. Mm -hmm. if I, but if I don't spend enough time on vehicle or intern, if they're not sold on the asset class of multifamily, but I'm selling them on our strategy, our edge, and then I'm trying to sell them on, oh, here's our pref. Here's our catch up. Here's our carried interest. And they're not yet sold on the asset class of multifamily, then it's, they're never going to close. I think they got to be so, sold on multifamily, but then not necessarily on your splits and whatever, but you and how you're going to perform. I think that ultimately, like, why am I going with you? Why do I like your brand? And why is your brand going to provide for me and my family? Mm -hmm. And, I, and I'll so that would that, be the, that would yeah. be the internal. Yeah. yeah. So that would be vehicle would be multifamily internal. I V I E. Yeah. Internal would be, okay. You're I'm sold on Gino and Jake's. Wow. These guys are amazing. They, the, in, like the, like, how does it work for us right here? So you're, you're spot on Jake. Yeah. yeah. So and, it's and never, Gino, Gino will invest with you. I, I've been crypto winner before that was a thing, <laughs> but Gino might invest in your fund. So, so uh, listen, just to wrap that up, it's never about the time and it's never about the money. If you hear those two objections, it really isn't go back and listen to what Bridger's saying. All right, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Now we have had a great run in multifamily going from zero units to over 250 million in assets. That's over 2000 apartment deals that we've been able to purchase through our framework buy right, manage right, and finance right. Now, Jake and I, we created the Jake and Gino community back in 2015. We launched our first book, Build Our Profits. And since then, our students have closed over 60,000 units. That's over $4 billion in assets they've been able to close over the last six years. And that's why this community has been so successful. We call it results-based education, and we pour back into the community everything that we've learned on our journey from zero to 2,000 units, and all our systems and scale that we use on our very own property management and investing company. Jake, I love that. It's not just education, it's implementation. So what I want you to do, click on that link down below, apply to work with our team, see how we can help you on your journey in multifamily. All right, we are back. Uh, let's talk about scaling a fund because in my opinion, it's a business within a business or it's its own business. So maybe some tips for the folks of actually scaling that business early on and, and things that you've done. Uh, funds, in my opinion, are all about track record and all about, and a fund is a long-term game. Uh, some people show up and like, Bridger, I want to be a billionaire on my first fund. And I go, okay, we can try it. But like, that's typically not how it rolls. Do you run away Usually from that person? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just run, run far away. Um, <laughs> But fund one usually is to build you a, tr a mantra tracker of being a good money manager. It dovetails into fund two. Usually by fund three is where you make your big, your money. Then fund four, fund five. And so it's a, it's a long-term game. Um, and nothing wrong about syndicate. I think syndicating is fine. It's just, if you're, if you have a long tail approach and you really want to scale this business, um, I believe you'll eventually be frustrated with syndications. Um, and really the the main route for most people is to just to pull those into a fund that get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what you have is you have enough cash flow spinning off enough management fees that you can continue to grow. Like you said, a business within the business to grow that fund, uh, whether it's capital raising and or compliance and or the, the accounting and legal and, and make play the play a big game. It's like going from a small business to a biz, you know, a big business. It's that transition. And some people don't want to do that. And that's totally fine. But in my opinion, it takes the same amount of work to run a small business as it does to run a big business. That's from Steven Schwartzman. And I actually totally agree with that quote. Like it, cause it takes everything you got to run a small business or a big business. What's and the quote? So Tell you, me the quote again. The quote is it takes as much effort to run a small business as it does to run a big business. I don't so think that's correct well run a big business. I think it probably takes more to run a small business. It like, not that we're a me, like medium sized business, right? We got like 80 employees on our, on our staff. I think it was much harder when it was me, Gino and like the one maintenance guy, 
than having a team around you. So I think it's actually much harder when you're running something very small than when you start to get scale. But I, I get the point that he's making. So. Well, and it, yeah, and I think you make a, a decent point. It's, it's the life cycle of business. You just get different problems. And his point was, it's just, it's going to take everything you got. Yeah. Right. When you're running a small business, it's going to take everything you got. When you run a big business, it's going to take everything you got. So you might as well run a big business. Yeah. You might as well play big. That mm-hmm. was his point, which I totally agree with. Um, and it sounds like you guys agree with as well. And so that was his point with the fund. Yes. It's, it's, it, it's, there's other, there's just bigger problems. Like you guys, you have 80 employees now yet. Now you got to deal with HR concerns. People want time off that you have to fire people, hire people. Like that's a, those are totally different problems. Manager, second tier, third tier managers. You have to train now that are probably maybe doing weird stuff or changing the business. That's a way just different problems than you had when it was three people. Mm-hmm. But you've upgraded your problems and it's, and it's a still a similar amount of work. But now you get, if the margin of error and your enterprise value your business is, I'm guessing, much larger than it was when you had three people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. D- describe the evolution of, of your business because you have the, the crypto fund, um, but there is the, the sense that as you start growing your fund, you're having more employees, you're going through that same type of life cycle. Do you see the fund, you know, managing the the assets as well and going in, you know, with the crypto or is it is it going to get split more where you're just placing money in the future? Um, it's a good question. And and funny enough, funds are very different, different. T- so real estate funds, for example, a lot of real estate funds end up having their own property manager. They have lots of employees because they're now managing 8,000 units around the country. So they'll have thousands of employees. Contrast that with Citadel. Citadel is run by Ken Griffin on, on Wall Street. They manage about $68 billion. They have 400 employees. They produced a $26 billion return to investors last year with 400 employees. Like, it's just it's stupid. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, un, that's insane. Like, that's unreal. Like, your average employee is produced, I don't know, like the number, it's like 80 million a year or something like that on, on an average count. Um, you probably do the math. I mean, it's more than that. You can do the math on it. But um, so hedge funds scale uh, exponentially because you just add zeros. You're really just going to add a few more people for maybe compliance, maybe a few more traders. But a lot of times it's just adding zeros. Uh, venture capital funds, even pri- sometimes even private equity funds can do the same thing. You know, you have a board of, you know, eight or nine people that are really good at venture capital. They do board meetings. You don't need to add that many people to your head count to do more deals. Um, it's a similar head count to run a $200 million fund as it is to run a a $2 billion fund. Uh, real estate though does scale because you a lot of times you're on the grounds, you're helping, you're doing value add. Private equity can be the same way. Uh, private equity is where you're buying businesses and you sometimes will buy a business and you'll send in a team to like help build and redo that business. So you That's what I'm getting out. at. Do you see, do you yeah. see more of that or, or simply, um, you know, more of like you said, like the, the, the Ken Griffin route where it's, you know, going to be less, less team members, more, you know, you know, acquisitions and things like that. It just depends on the fund strategy and fund type. So I don't say there's a right or wrong. It's just more of what makes sense for your fund and, and how you're going to add value to your portfolio of investments. Uh, you brought up Warren Claff a minute ago and, you know, bringing in to you know, speak to your community and whatnot. Um, any other, you know, authors or books you've read in the last year or so that's added value to your life? Um, what's funny enough in the fund space, there's not a lot of great books in my opinion on funds or, and, or like building a fund. There's some people that write books that they run like a $30 billion fund and that's fine to read about, but they're so far removed from people that are just starting. There's not a lot of, um, a a lot of great books on that, but, um, as, and you're just asking general, just in books in general, any, any content or any book that, you know, that, that you've consumed recently that's added value that you want to share with the folks. One I thought was super interesting was a book called Lost and Founder. Russell Brunson actually told me to read this book and I, I went and read it. It was very interesting. It talks about two different life cycles of founders. And he goes, you have a venture-backed founder. And he's like, the guy writing the book, he's like, I started a venture-backed company. It's worth like $200, $300 million right now. He's like, I'm, I'm living the dream as a venture founder. I have other friends that launch service-based companies that are bootstrapped and they'll sell for a much smaller multiple because the, the truth is, the average venture back company, the founder ends up with 11%. That's the average. So for example, if you sold your company for $100 million, you had a successful exit, you, the average founder ends up with $11 million. Versus a service-based company or a bootstrap company, the founder usually ends up with 50 to 100%. So if you had two companies, both doing 10 million a year, the software company would get a 10x multiple, the service company would get like a two and a half or three x multiple. This, again, the, the software company would sell for 100 million. You'd get 
a, an $11 million check. The other company though would sell for like $30 million, but you'd get a maybe 20 to $25 million check as the bootstrap founder. So it was, there's this myth that every, you got to have a venture back company. It's so great. And it's actually not. And actually he shared his company. He's ran, I believe for 11 years. He's the CEO. The venture capitalist he brought in locked up his equity. He goes, on paper, I'm worth all this money. He goes, I get paid about 200,000 a year. I live in an apartment in, in San Jose. I drive a Tesla and I've never been able to exercise or sell any equity in my company. And they still lock it up. He goes, it's been 11 years running my company. That's the reality. And, and these pitfalls you need to look out for if you're going to go a route where you're going to raise money and or bootstrap your company. I thought it was very insightful from someone who's, he's like, I've done it. I'm in the game. Don't do these things. And I, it actually changed my whole mindset on business, being a founder, starting businesses. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. I'm not anti-fund or anti-syndications. It just wasn't the right fit for us. So, you know, in our you know career of investing multifamily, we've I think done 2,200 units and about 500 of those were syndications. Uh, we sold two thirds of them and I just didn't, um, I didn't like that extra business component of managing the investors and, and then actually sharing in the profits. So we kind of switched back, you know, midstream of our career and we just went back to investing our own capital and, you know, doing kind of the bootstrap uh, route that you're talking about. And it just suits us better. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it wrong. We just enjoy, you know, investing our own capital and, and growing our business that way um, worked for us. So I think it's interesting because I, I yeah. think that total control it was, was nice for us. And not that we didn't have control in the syndications, but it was, it was the total, you know, ownership of the asset as well. But I think we had the optionality to do that, Bridger. We've refined over 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 twenty five million dollars in the portfolio, and we didn't go buy the Ferraris or the Lambos. We just reinvested into the business, and we're focusing on profit per unit. We have you know different kinds of KPIs that we focus on, and it's just for us, just controlling where we're geographically located, we're vertically integrated, so we're managing our own stuff. So it doesn't lend to the model as much. And we're like, you know what, we're great. Where we've gotten through a couple of market cycles, we like where the portfolio is, and if we do three or four hundred units a deal, where we own all the equity. And I think that's to your point, really think about what you want your model to be. And it can change midstream because you may have to start out raising capital and, and, and you know, going out and getting investors. And at, at some point you may say to yourself, oh, I think this 50 unit makes more sense if I can own 90% of the equity, just like the founder where the founder has all that equity as opposed to the person who has 7,000 units, but only has maybe 2% equity in those 7,000 units. Ask yourself the tough question. Do you want to own a portfolio of 7,000 units with 2% equity or do you want to have 300 units where you're the you know master of your own fate? It's a really great question to ask yourself. Yeah. Do you want to run a big big business or small? Yeah. I think it's spot on. Mm -hmm. So that book, Lost and Founder, it was it was good for me running Fun Launch. Our Fun, fun Launch is a bootstrap company. We've never raised outside capital. And it's always been this alert, like, oh, like I have friends that go raise at these huge evaluations and, you know, raise all this money. And I always felt like, oh man, I should probably be doing that. You know what I mean? Like that, like, oh, you know what? That sounds cool. Like, and then I, and then I look back and like, well, maybe it's not as cool as it, uh, as it looks out to be, but anyway, mm -hmm. it's just good to understand. Yeah, yeah, and you see that you see like the, the, you know, LinkedIn post and you start getting FOMO or something like, oh, I need to be doing that. <laughs> yeah. But you know, what's really behind it and where, where the splits at, I think what's mm -hmm. what counts. So crazy enough, uh, Elon Musk owns about 11% of Tesla. After all the splits and everything, he ends up with about worked 11. okay for him. <laughs> yeah, it worked. I mean, it worked well, right? He played the big business, but it's back to that average. The average founder ends up with about eleven percent of their company at the end. Which wow. is pretty interesting. That, that is interesting. Uh, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? Uh, they want to learn more about your community, et cetera. Yeah, so we uh, we actually have a full. I, 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 my goal is to help more people understand the game of investment funds. I believe more of us need to understand this game. Um, last year, one in five homes were purchased by institutional big Wall Street investors. Oh, we missed that. Before. Yeah, dive into that a little bit. We missed that today. Yeah, I guess we can hit that. Yeah, the year before was one in seven homes. I mean, we are seeing institutions buying up homes. We see them buying up uh, companies. Uh, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard are estimated to control 40% of the S&P 500 by 2030. Um, shareholder vote. If you look right now, I mean, they're already on, well on their way. And so it's a scary world we are approaching, in my opinion. Um, that a few mega funds, two or three funds can control full market sentiment about everything. Um, for example, you saw like, Disney is a great example. Everyone keeps like, why, why is Disney pushing all this woke content and ESG stuff? And very obviously their fan base doesn't like it. They just had another one fail at the box office. Like they're, 
their customers are telling them like, we don't want political stuff in our kids shows. I don't care what side of the, how many billions is it going to take to lose before that, that ship starts to turn around? It's crazy. They have lost over $160 billion in market cap from their peak. They're down 65%. How are they not getting sued? That's what I want to understand. How is a shareholder saying to themselves, this makes no sense. The writing's on the wall. Captain Marvel's opened up to $50 million. It grossed less than Hulk back in 2000. Just put that in perspective for a second. It's Crazy. just insanity. And you know why it's happening. You can understand why it's happening. You see it happening. Why aren't shareholders actually suing Disney? That makes no sense. 160, you said $160 billion. Yep. They Apple has enough cash on their balance sheet to buy Disney outright right now. Isn't that insane? <laughs> how much, that's just crazy, by the way. But the, you look at the, their, their largest shareholders are State Street, Vanguard, and BlackRock. They collectively own, I think, around 30% of their, of their stock. Now, obviously, that's her. And, and Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, has come out and said, man, maybe ESG wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be. But, and I don't know the backdoor meetings, but what I, at least what we've seen is – this CEO of Disney or just name XYZ company, they have to please their largest shareholders. And so if BlackRock or Vanguard comes to him and says, hey, we need to push an ESG agenda. And by the way, I, I talked to a guy who's an expert on ESG. He's like, ESG is great. Or e and G is great. The S is the problem. The social, so environmental, social, governance. Social, who decides social? Just some committee? What's good? What's bad? No, That's the, the no but it's, it's the loudest right? It, it's yeah. the loudest. Yep. And it's usually a small percentage of people that scream and, and they get the, the voice and they're heard because everyone else is living their lives with shit to do. And so you have this small minority of people pushing, you know, larger groups because they feel bad for them and they're whining. And then, and they're, you know, the, the people without a voice, even though they're the ones screaming. So I think that's, that's the biggest issue right there. Well, and it dovetails to then you have, let's call it Vanguard or BlackRock, owns 9% of Disney and says, hey, we need you to push ESG stuff or else we're going to sell your stock and tank you even further. And so the, the CEO of XYZ company called, called Disney, Bob Iger, he's like, he's in a tough spot. He's got these three big companies that are like, hey, we're going to sell 30% of your stock unless you push this certain agenda. And then he turns around, his customers though, hate that agenda. <laughs> the, the, it what probably they've turned to out to be out the, the best time, thing for him. probably didn't know at the it. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's an interesting thing. And, and what I'm getting at is, again, I don't know the backdoor conversations, but what I'm, I'm scared of is that we will live in a world that only a few companies control everything and can push. Right now, it's like 450 of the Fortune 500 companies. Those three are the largest shareholders. And, and if so if one person, Larry Fink, wants to push a certain thing, he has control over 450 of the S&P 500 company CEOs. They answer to him. And it's just, it's a, it's a twisted society that you can see how quickly that could go bad. My opinion is more, we just, we can't, we can protest. We can get mad on social media. Nothing will change. What we need to do is beat them at their own game. We need to go launch funds that buy up and decentralize Wall Street. I'm okay if 10,000 funds independently own stock and shareholder vote. That's fine with me. I'm not okay with, though with three companies that control it, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for a competition. I'm all for a competitive market. I'm all for capitalism. But it just needs to be true capitalism. So my opinion is I believe more people need to understand this game. You need to understand how funds work. Even if you're not going to start a fund, understand the mechanics of how these big players Same that are things happen with the banks come, too, right? Yeah. With banks, the, who the shareholders are, how they work, how they buy up companies, how they might come buy your company one day or buy homes. Like what are their end goals? And if you can understand at least the game, maybe us, we, the people can decentralize this centralization that's going on and have a more competitive marketplace. So, with that being said, you asked how do people connect with us? We, we put out a ton of free content. I have a full free course on investment funds. So it's like 20 plus videos we, we build out just for free to help people understand this game, get their, their legs under them and start them on this game of funds. So if you go to fundlaunch.com, it's hundred percent free. They can check it out. And yes, we have other courses and bigger. We have, we help people launch funds. We launched 130 funds last year. So if you want to like actually have us coach you and launch through that fund, we have programs like that, but just for free base level, if people want to like learn about this game fundlaunch.com. We have a total free platform to just help people educate them. And I think more people need to understand this game and what's going on at a bigger picture. Gino, take us home. Jake, you have a young Bridger in college, sophomore. He goes to college to learn how to make money. He's got six businesses. 
he's rocking it. Gets out of college. His dad pulls him over one day and says, Bridger, you're running around with like a chicken without a head. Go check out my business partner. My business partner can help you out. So Bridger gets in the car, drives to his business partner, dad's business partner. And he looks oh. around and he goes, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? He walks in this palatial home. He's looking at the marble. He's looking at the staircases. And he talks to his, his dad's business partner. And his dad's business partner says, Bridger, your dad's just as loaded. And then you can see the steam coming out of Bridger's ears and going... <laughs> What the hell? I couldn't even get a Coke at Chipotle. What's going on here? Goes back to his dad. And as he's going back to his dad, he sees the dent in his Ford Expedition saying, I still can't believe my dad's got as much money as his business partner. But he says to his dad, you know, what are you doing? How have you done this? And he just says, you know, Bridger, I'm different. I'm living a conservative lifestyle. I like what I'm doing. That's the psychology of money that I have. That's the relationship of money that I have. I don't really need these, these high blingy things. I like the life that I have. And from there, they develop this great relationship, the mentor relationship, where the son is talking to the dad and, and the son's learning from the dad. And then he decides, hey, let me start a fund. And he goes to dad. Hey, Pops, I got this great idea. You want to invest with me? Bridger, my son, you're going to have to do it on your own. It's going to be a hard lesson to learn, but I have faith in you. And Bridger once again says, I can't believe Pops rejected me. But you know what? I'm going to show Pops. I'm going to go out there and raise the money on my own. And after talking to everybody he knows, these little loans of 5000 here, 7000 there, he puts together $49,000. He returns 64% on his first year, 50-something percent in his second year. And by the third year, exits that fund. And there launches the Bridger Pennington brand. Bridger, love having you on the show today, brother. Great show. Thank you all. All right, guys. Well done, Gino. And gang, as always, we believe in buying deals for the long term. Think in decades. I'm Jake. He's the G-Daddy, and we make it happen. We'll see you next time.